Hello, everyone. Well, I have a special guest today, Dr. Charlotte. He is a physician, published author of Why Doctors Skip Breakfast. I didn't even know that, but that's what he's written the book about. He's also an advocate for women's and kids' health, as well as a big advocate for sustainable real estate. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm super excited to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about the conversation. Yes. So our focus is on perimenopausal, menopausal, and beyond, as you know. So I really wanted you to take this time today, specifically for women who are going through perimenopause on nutrition, nutrition supplements, what should they focus on? Yeah, those are great questions. And, and I get this a lot. And, you know, the thing is, when you go through menopause and afterwards, your nutritional needs change, you know, they're not the same as they once were beforehand. And so it's important that your diet changes to kind of reflect things so you could be as healthy as possible. So you have less symptoms, and that you avoid some of the kind of common health problems that hit women at older age, like heart disease, osteoporosis, cancer, that type of thing. Okay, so so now the thing is, what is happening is, you know, women going through perimenopause, their hormones are changing. We know that now, estrogen and progesterone, and also testosterone. Now, and there's a debate about going through hormonal replacement therapy or fix it through nutrition. So let's just talk a little bit about if nutrition and nutrition supplements, if women start doing that, can they um, uh, skip hormone replacement therapy or not? That's a huge question. I know it's it's a loaded question. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we just have to stick to the nutrition, nutrition supplements. What should we do? What should well I'll tell you, there are certain sound practices that really, in my opinion, nearly every woman should follow, regardless of whether they use hormone replacement therapy or not. And I'll tell you some of the big ones. One of them is iron. So Everybody needs iron, women need iron, um, but women need more iron, it turns out, before menopause and after. So if you're a woman who has a very high iron diet naturally, like perhaps we eat a lot of red meat, for example, or you take iron supplements, you actually might be able to cut that back. And it's really not recommended that women after menopause even take iron supplements because you simply don't need it that much. And it's probably true that unless, unless you're someone who has anemia, you know, obviously you have to speak to your doctor. Don't just go by me. I'm seeing you on Facebook live here, but, but, but for the vast majority of women, if you were taking iron supplements before, the good news is you cut that stuff out after menopause, you don't need it. But the flip side of the coin is calcium. So it turns out that women need more calcium after menopause, during perimenopause and after, than they needed before. And so, you know, the recommendations are that women before menopause, say like in their 20s, for example, get around a gram of calcium, that's a thousand milligrams a day. Afterwards, you actually need more. You need like 1200 milligrams or even more than that. So it's important to think about things like either perhaps having calcium fortified milks. I, I love flax milk. And for those of you at home, there's this great flax milk. It's got protein, it's got calcium. Uh, soy milk with calcium added is a good one. There's a lot of different things. You could take calcium supplements. Spinach is a lot of calcium. So there, you could eat, if you're into uh, canned fish, uh, sardines, things like that, especially with the bones in, that has a lot of calcium. So those are good ways of getting it. You need more of it. You know, another big one, and, and this is something that people don't like to admit to, but it's just the truth. And I, I could tell you I'm in my 40s. I've seen it myself. As you get older, you simply don't need as many calories. And so, and, and this is true for women, especially after they go through menopause, their caloric needs drop. And so what you don't want to do is you don't want to overeat later. And, and then you run the risk of of gaining weight or, or running at the health problems. And so I think it's important for women, perimenopausal women and postmenopausal women to sort of modify their diet so they're not as calorically dense. Now, nobody likes hearing, don't eat this, don't eat that. You know, I don't like hearing it. You know, nobody likes it. So what I recommend, there's a couple easy tricks to this actually, where you can kind of have a lower calorically dense diet. One of them is like you mentioned, you could fast, which is a popular thing. That, that was the why doctors skip breakfast. It was, it was about fasting and the benefits of that. And so you could talk about, you could check that out in my book if you're interested, why doctors skip breakfast. But another one is if you simply eat more fruits and vegetables, especially vegetables, if you just add those to your diet, 
your diet will naturally become less calorically dense. In other words, if you think about a, say you have like a candy bar, it's a little thing, or even a lot of those bars, you know, it's small, like this big, you know, but it's got 200 calories or something. How long does it take you to eat that? You know, like a minute. So in a minute, you've just scarfed down 200 calories. Whereas to eat 200 calories of broccoli, say, you know, you, I have an air fryer, you know, the air fry, it's very good. You have to eat a massive amount of broccoli to get 200 calories. So you can still eat just as much food. It's just less calorically dense. That, I think I think that makes sense. The other thing uh, uh, what I want to bring is that a lot of women go through emotional upheaval right during this process because of the hormones and and also it's a, it's a difficult time emotionally. So do you recommend like the anxiety right that it happens or and women who are working can be very difficult because a lot of women, managers don't understand at workplace what's going on with them. So what can they do to, from a supplement point of view or from a nutrition point of view only to calm themselves? Well, there's a few great things that, that you can do. One of them, which seems to have positive effects on, on mood, it certainly helps with the brain, is omega-3s. I'm a big advocate of omega-3s. There is some growing research that omega-3s are very useful for perimenopausal and, and postmenopausal women. They really come in handy in old age. As you know, as you get older, for people listening in their 60s, 70s, you're never too late to start. You know, I got my dad and my mom started on, on omega-3s, you know, and, and they're, you know, they're they're not they're not spring chickens. And it helps. And so I recommend taking relatively high dose omega-3s. So if you get those those gel caps. I, I like the ones from Costco. They're they're pretty cheap. They're sustainably farmed, and and I think they're not as bad for the environment. You know, I would take like two or three of those a day, and and also it's kind of recommended that you have maybe at least if you if if you eat it two or three servings of fatty fish a week. So that could be things like salmon or mackerel, sardines, stuff like that. So that's one good thing. But you know, another thing, and, and this is I think very important. It, it's not nutrition, but there's clear research that one of the best ways you could regulate your mood is through sleep and exercise. And this is true really for everybody, but I think it's especially true and especially important for perimenopausal women, which is if you can get your sleep uh, standardized. So what I mean is you follow good sleep hygiene, like you go to bed at the same time every day, uh, you get up at the same time every day, you sleep in a cold, dark room, you don't have caffeine late in the day. You don't have alcohol late in the day. That's that type of thing really helps with mood regulation and you know feeling better and kind of being just kind of more even keeled. And and you know that's what we're all I think looking for. And the same thing is true with exercise. When you exercise more, which I think is especially important for postmenopausal women, it's better for mood. Clear clear research on this. If you wanna if you wanna find a non medical way of improving your mood, exercise really is probably one of the best, especially early exercise, or exercise earlier in the day. It's really one of the best things. It's good for mood, but also exercise helps prevent one of the main problems that postmenopausal women have, which is osteoporosis. So when you get out there and you're exercising, you're improving your mood, you're helping your bones, you're helping to prevent heart disease and cancer. I mean, it's really one of the best things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So this is a quick 10 minute session that we bring on a daily basis. Um, anything else that you'd like to add uh, before we wrap up? Uh, maybe you can add a little bit on the osteoporosis. You think, yeah, uh, any particular type of exercise women should do uh, to make sure they don't get into the osteoporosis or anything else you'd like to add? So osteoporosis is a big deal. And, and I see this, I have personally, I'm an anesthesiologist by training. I have personally seen this where you have women that are otherwise very healthy. They're still working, they're caring for their grandkids or doing everything, but they have a fall. It isn't even a big deal. It's not like they're hit by a car. They, they fall on the stairs and they trip on the sidewalk. They break a bone. And even though they can have surgery afterwards, their lives are forever changed by this. They often can't do what they once could. Many of them have chronic pain. Their ability to exercise afterwards is cut back. Maybe they can't work anymore. So something that happens in a blink of an eye can have life-changing consequences. So one of the best ways of preventing that is calcium, vitamin D, which we didn't really talk about, but you know, you want to get at least 600 IUs of vitamin D a day. You really can't get that through diet. You have to take that as a supplement. You just can't get enough vitamin D through diet for the vast majority of people. And then exercise 
you know, the things that are really good are impact exercises. So brisk walks, uh, running, if you like to run, if you play tennis, any of those things, things that put sort of axial impact on your legs from, from running around. Pickleball is a great one. I've recently gotten into it. I love it. Everybody seems to like it. All those things will help strengthen your bones and reduce the risk of osteoporosis. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, this is a quick 10 minute session, but so much information you've given. Just want to be, put a big disclaimer, just because we have MD, this is not a medical advice. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Shara, for, for joining me today. Um, and any, uh, you, if you have a book or any website you want to share, please feel free to do that. And I, I will also add it below the, you know, below this uh, live session. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. If you look for Gregory Charlop, C-H-A-R-L-O-P. I'm also on Facebook. I don't use it as much. And the book, Why Doctors Skip Breakfast, you can grab your copy on Amazon or Audible. And it was great to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for supporting us. Bye-bye.